With plans now underway to equip Ukraine's armed forces with America's Patriot Air Defense System, the internet is abuzz with debate about just how effective this system really is, and how it stacks up against Russian peers like the S-400. And as usual, the truth is a bit more complicated than you might think. Let's dive into what the Patriot is, and what it can and can't do for Ukraine. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is air power. So usually when I start these videos, I'm working off a pretty complete story that I can more or less use as a script, but that's not the case today. My dive into the Patriot air defense systems, its capabilities, its limitations, and how it compares to its peers has manifested in an 18-page single-spaced treatise that is just way too much to go over in any one video. And seeing as this video needs to go out tomorrow, I don't have time to whittle it all down into one script. So, to some extent, I'm going to be using it as an outline while I wing it. So, please bear with me. We'll start with the basics on what the MIM-104 Patriot Air Defense System even is, but then we'll dive a bit into its controversial past and why it's perceived today as an ineffective platform despite its high success rates. America's MIM-104 Patriot Air Defense System first entered service back in the early 1980s. It was developed by Raytheon with a focus on defending against high-performance aircraft, like Soviet fighters. But by the mid-80s, it was already clear that the Army had a pressing need for a defense against what they called tactical missiles. In other words, short-range ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and air-to-surface missiles deployed by air and rotorcraft. Now, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles offer very different challenges for air defenses, really because of the inherent differences in how they operate. Ballistic missiles, like Russia's air-launched Kinzel, or even its nuclear-armed RS-28 Sarmat ICBM, could really be thought of as similar to rockets. They're commonly launched using conventional rocket boosters along a high-arcing ballistic flight path before separating from the booster and careening back toward their target at extremely high rates of speed. Nearly all ballistic missiles achieve hypersonic velocities as they approach their targets, but unlike modern hypersonic missiles, they don't maneuver during that descent, making their trajectories fairly predictable, despite their high speed. Cruise missiles, on the other hand, could really be thought of as more akin to suicide drones. They're usually powered by air-breathing jet engines just like a tactical aircraft or fighter jet, which allows them to fly under power along a more horizontal and unpredictable trajectory. These weapons fly at much lower speeds than ballistic missiles, but can be more dangerous due to their maneuverability and the ability to use the curvature of the Earth to mask their approach. It doesn't matter what kind of air defense system you're operating. If it's not networked to other assets like airborne AWACS, its radar is limited by line of sight, which makes cruise missiles really dangerous for these systems, especially when launched in volume. Before the Patriot ever saw a fight, it already received two upgrades, referred to as PAC-1 and PAC-2. PAC stands for Patriot Advanced Capability. PAC-1 was a software upgrade, but PAC-2 included changes to the hardware itself, like a new fuse and larger fragments within the explosive warhead. These changes were really meant to make the system better at intercepting missiles. But once the Patriot arrived in the Gulf War, it didn't perform as well as America would have hoped. I'm going to quote a popular TikTok and YouTube content creator who also happens to be a U.S. Army Patriot Fire Control Enhanced Operator, Sergeant First Class Long. Now, I spoke to Long as I was putting this story together, but I really recommend you check out his content for yourself. He's both informative and funny, and his stuff's really worth your time. In the first Gulf War, Patriot was right around 25%. It was doing something it wasn't necessarily designed for. It was actually built for planes, but they decided to throw it at missiles, and it sometimes hit. Since then, we have vastly improved the system, like hundreds of upgrades. Nowadays, Patriot has right around a 95% hit ratio. Now, we're going to come back to that Gulf War performance because it's really why the Patriot has such a negative perception. But before we get there, let's talk about the makeup of the system itself. The United States has committed to providing Ukraine an entire Patriot battery, which consists of six primary components, 
a generator, a radar array, an engagement control station, truck-based launchers, an antenna mast group, and the Patriot interceptor missiles themselves. But it is important to remember that in the U.S., Patriot batteries don't operate as an island unto themselves. They really serve as one portion of a layered defense strategy, something that both Long and the Army refer to as defense in depth. Basically, it just means that the U.S. operates different air defense systems in layers. So if a missile manages to defeat one system, it likely won't defeat the next one and the next one as well. And that's really important because despite popular online perceptions of air defense systems as these impenetrable bubbles, none of them really are. Intercepting a missile is a really tall order. So layering air defenses is a really effective way of preventing missiles from finding their targets. You're just maximizing your chances. Today's Patriot systems come equipped with interceptors that fall into one of two missile families, either Pac-2 or Pac-3. But what's really cool about the Patriot air defense system is that all of these interceptors can be launched before the system has secured what we refer to as a weapons-grade lock, or a targeting solution for the inbound aircraft or missile. Instead, the weapon is actually launched in what's called an initial flyout stage of its guidance approach, where it's then fed active guidance information from the Patriot's radar array until it gets close enough to the target to transition to its own internal guidance system. Now, this means that the Patriot can engage platforms that it itself does not have a radar lock on at the time of launch. But it also means that by the time a pilot receives the warning that they've been locked onto, that missile is already airborne and closing fast, giving them very little time to react. I'm going to quote Navy Lieutenant Commander Rod Candeloro, who was an F-18 Hornet pilot during Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Patriot is by far the most lethal SAM system in the world, and there's no airplane in existence that's going to get away from it. The missile itself is also designed to bias its impact on the nose of the aircraft so as to kill the pilot. If a Patriot is fired at your aircraft, you might as well eject, because there's nothing you can do to get away from it. Now, if that sounded a bit like concern, you'd be right, because at the time, the system was proving very effective at intercepting enemy missiles with its processes automated. But that automation also ultimately led to two friendly fire incidents, one against a Royal Air Force Tornado and another against a U.S. Navy Hornet. And all of the crew members involved in these intercepts were killed. Now, since then, the system has seen a number of upgrades, but it's also seen changes in how it's leveraged, putting the human operator firmly back in the loop to prevent this from happening again. But let's get back to those two families of interceptors, the first being the PAC-2 Guidance Enhanced Missile Tactical, or GEMT, as opposed to GEMC with the C denoting cruise missile. These are modern iterations of the PAC-2 interceptors that benefit from those PAC-1 and 2 updates we discussed before, as well as a number of other enhancements meant to improve its performance against tactical missiles. One of those enhancements comes in the form of a new proximity fuse for their explosive fragmentation warheads, which really represents one of the biggest operational differences between PAC-2 and PAC-3 interceptors. PAC-2 interceptors use an explosive fragmentation warhead that detonates once they're near their target, whereas PAC-3 interceptors use hit-to-kill technology. In other words, they literally collide with their target, using kinetic force to destroy them instead. The other most notable enhancement in the PAC-2 GEMT is a low-noise oscillator in the nose that allows for improved targeting of aircraft or missiles that have a very low radar cross-section. And while the Patriot system may have struggled against Iraqi scuds during the Gulf War, the PAC-2 GEMT, and Patriot in general, intercepted every ballistic missile they engaged during 2003's Operation Iraqi Freedom, really showing how much the system matured in the decade-plus between conflicts. But those PAC-2 GEMT interceptors aren't the only heat the Patriot's packing. It also carries two different types of PAC-3 interceptors, which, as I mentioned before, use hit-to-kill technology to actually intercept missiles physically. While PAC-2 interceptors are made by Raytheon like the Patriot itself, PAC-3 interceptors were a completely clean-sheet design from Lockheed Martin, meant to maximize what you could get out of the Patriot system. 
These interceptors use an active Ka band radar seeker for terminal guidance, and they come with 180 solid fueled attitude control motors, or ACMs, in its forward section that allow for an incredible degree of maneuverability. And despite this leap in performance, Pac 3 missiles are much smaller than Pac 2 missiles, which reduces their overall range, but that increased maneuverability allows them to defend a larger overall area. The Pac 3 MSC, or Missile Segment Enhanced, is slightly larger and offers some different capabilities than the Pac-3 CRI, which stands for Cost Reduction Initiative. But how many of these interceptors does a single Patriot battery use? Well, it depends. A single Patriot battery can include up to eight separate M901 launch stations. One launch station carries four launch canisters. These canisters can each hold one Pac-2 GEMT interceptor, or three Pac-3 enhanced missiles, or as many as four Pac-3 cost reduction missiles. America's Patriot systems tend to deploy with an assortment of these interceptors to offer the best option for whatever the incoming threat may be. Now, I want to be clear that what these interceptors are really capable of, and really how they operate, are closely guarded secrets. But there are some things that we can glean from publicly disclosed information. And by compiling data from both the New York Times and the Center for Strategic International Studies, I've been able to assess that the Pac-2 GEMT can intercept cruise missiles or aircraft at a distance of at least 99 miles, whereas the Pac-3 MSE has a range of about 75 miles for cruise missiles and aircraft and 44 miles for ballistic missiles. And the Pac-3 Cost Reduction Initiative has a range of about 40 miles for cruise missiles and aircraft and about 22 for ballistic missiles. But if I were a betting man, my money would be on these being fairly conservative estimates, especially because they've been publicly released. But as important as interceptors are, radar may even be more important, and Patriot batteries have operated a number of different arrays over the years, known as the AN-MPQ-53, 65, and 65A. Unlike Russia's Nebo-M, leveraged by both the S-300 and S-400, the Patriot radar actually combines surveillance, tracking, and engagement functions into one assembly mounted on a single trailer. Now that really reduces deployment time and increases mobility, while offering the same function and performance of multiple arrays on multiple trailers. And once again, when we're talking about these radar arrays, I'll give you the disclosed information, but we should take it with a big grain of salt. Now there are a lot of letters and numbers here that can get confusing, so I'll abbreviate the older radar system as the 53 system and the newer one as the 65. The older 53 system has a claimed range of better than 62 miles, using low-frequency C-band arrays for long-range detection and higher-frequency G and H bands for precision targeting. The more modern 65 system offers a disclosed range of better than 93 miles. But here's the thing. Foreign allies that operate the Patriot system have disclosed that the 53 system actually offers a range of about 105 miles or better. And that suggests that the newer 65 system can reach a lot further than has been acknowledged. But here's the thing about the MPQ-65 that really blows my mind. To be honest, I don't quite understand how this works, but it's said to have a passive radar array, which means it doesn't broadcast electromagnetic signals that can be used by anti-radiation or radar hunting missiles to guide the weapon into the radar array. The system is said to be capable of tracking up to 100 airborne targets at once, all while guiding nine separate missiles toward nine separate targets. But as capable as these systems are, they do have distinct limitations. One big one is the inability to offer full 360 degree coverage. But today, the Army's working on rolling out yet another, even newer array for the Patriot, dubbed the Lower Tier Air and Missile Defense System, or LTAMDS. This is part of Raytheon's Ghost Eye family of radars, and it not only offers full 360 degree coverage, but Raytheon claims it will also provide twice the detection power. Now, we don't know which radar system Ukraine will receive with their Patriot battery, but I'd imagine it'll be the older MPQ-53 to minimize the chances that Russia can gather valuable intel on the latest radar system's operation. Now, all this is to say that the Patriot air defense system is genuinely one of the most advanced and capable systems on the planet, with very few peers. But if that's true, then why is the Russian fanboy favorite, S-400, held in such high esteem in comparison? in internet debates. 
Well, part of it is certainly the trolling joy of being contrarian, but there's more to it than that. When the Patriot first rolled out during the Gulf War, it became the center of a great deal of controversy, because many people believed the Army lied about how effective it was. Now, I won't go into the whole soap opera here, but if you're interested, I'll do a whole video on it. I have a whole article on it in the works. But suffice to say, the Army initially claimed an extremely high intercept success rate during the Gulf War, and then rolled that back a bit, and then subsequent investigations made it look like even that rolled back claim was way too high. This was headline news for literally years, and it painted the Patriot as this ineffective system that was benefiting from some Army PR. Now, Sergeant First Class Long was the first to tell me that the Patriots' real success rate during the Gulf War was right around 25%, and the Government Accounting Office's own investigation supports that assertion. But Long also highlights the incredible progress the Patriot made between the Gulf War and Operation Iraqi Freedom, and the subsequent progress it's made since then. And that assertion is also substantiated in the data. This time, I'll quote a report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies released earlier this month. In contrast with the experience of Desert Storm, Patriot interceptors defeated every ballistic missile they engaged during the 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom. Since 2015, Patriot has successfully engaged scores of missiles and drones in the Yemen Missile War. Israel has likewise used it on a number of occasions to defeat drones, aircraft, and other threats. The fact of the matter is, the Patriot air defense system may be highly capable, but it has suffered from American transparency. The fact that two different governmental organizations investigated what they believed were overblown claims of the Patriots' success in the Gulf War, and then shared their findings with the American people and the world at large, has tainted perceptions of this platform for decades. When you compare that to Russia's transparency with systems like the S-400, you see how these perceptions can manifest. Between 1963 and 2020, the U.S. disclosed a total of 121 test intercepts with various air defense systems, with a pretty respectable outcome of a 72% success rate. Now, it's important to understand that that 72% success rate includes both the failures that you would expect in the early developmental stages of a program, as well as the success as you'd expect later on. Russia, on the other hand, has effectively claimed that the S-400 did not see a single developmental test, and only started testing once it was an operational system, in which, according to them, it has had a 100% intercept rate, despite never disclosing the types of targets it's intercepted, the capabilities of those targets, or even the circumstances of the tests. In a real way, as is so often the case, Russia basically just said, trust me, bro, and a lot of the media and internet did. Now, I want to be clear that that doesn't mean the S-400 is a bad system. I have a whole video diving into its very real capabilities and very real limitations. At the end of the day, we only have the information that's disclosed to us to work with, and the evidence seems to suggest that since the Gulf War, the U.S. has pretty consistently understated the Patriots' capabilities, while Russia has pretty evidently overstated the capabilities of their air defense systems from S-300 to S-500 and beyond. And that's not just my assertion. This time, I'll quote a 2020 report from the Nuclear Threat Initiative that was effectively outlining how air defense systems are not nearly as capable as most people tend to think, but even among them, Russia's claims are dubious at best. To date, we have not been able to identify any reports of failed intercept tests involving the S-400. Like our hypothesis involving India, this suggests Russia is concealing most of its developmental tests or other failed intercepts. Now, before any keyboard warriors chime in to say that maybe the S-400 just really has never failed an intercept test, let me remind you that the point of testing isn't to succeed. It's to identify the very real limitations of your system. So, if the S-400 has never failed a test, it means that the failure is of Russia's testing apparatus itself. And because there are very credible reports of S-400s failing in actual combat situations, that seems evident. All right, we've been going on for a while now, so let's briefly dive into what the Patriot air defense system can do for Ukraine and what it can't. The truth is, the Patriot air defense system is really well suited to engage some of the airborne threats facing Ukraine, but not all of them. 
A single Patriot battery just can't protect all of Ukrainian airspace. It honestly couldn't even protect all of Kyiv, but it could certainly protect an area of the city against a number of airborne threats. Cost is another important consideration, because Patriot interceptors tend to run between three and five million dollars a piece, so using them to take down Iranian drones that range from twenty to fifty thousand dollars a piece is a good way to find yourself losing a conflict through financial attrition. Now, of course, there are exceptions based on circumstances and objective, but as a general rule of thumb, it's a bad idea. And finally, there are concerns about the training curve being too steep. American service members often spend months training to operate the Patriot air defense system, but Ukrainian service members don't really have that kind of time. Now, Sergeant First Class Long and others have told me that you can train to operate the Patriot pretty effectively in a matter of weeks, maybe as few as two if you're willing to work some very long days. But there's serious risk involved with deploying the Patriot system before the operators are fully spun up in its operation. Most notably, it not operating to its full capability, which could result in it being destroyed very early on. Russia has already said they will make targeting this system a priority. Now, that would not only mean the destruction of a billion dollar piece of hardware and leaving Ukraine back where it started, but Russia could also use its destruction in information operations to discredit the Patriot air defense system in the eyes of the world. Right now, only 18 nations operate the Patriot air defense system, and the United States giving it to a nation is a significant political statement. The power and value of that statement could be dramatically diminished if Russia makes short work of Ukraine's Patriot battle. Battery. And as a result, that means that the U.S. giving Ukraine a Patriot battery now is an even bigger political statement. The truth is, shipping off boatloads of weapons isn't that big a deal for a nation as wealthy as the United States, but giving them a Patriot battery really is putting some skin in the game. So what does all this really mean? Well, it means that the Patriot air defense system is an incredibly capable system that is sure to make portions of Ukrainian skies safer. But it isn't a single miracle solution to owning Ukraine's skies. Any Russian aircraft, ballistic missile, or cruise missile that runs afoul of Ukraine's Patriot battery is likely going to have a very bad day. But one Patriot battery won't win this war for Ukraine. That's still up to them. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.